Good evening, First Baptist Church of Baylorton, and to each of you who have been joining us by way of YouTube and Facebook. I want to invite you this evening to turn with me to James chapter 4 in the Word of God, and let's read from verses 1 down through verse number 10. The Bible says in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in you lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. In this message this evening, I want to speak on this thought, a self-pleasing life, a self-pleasing life. And by way of introduction, I want to ask you, have you ever heard of the word hedonism? Hedonism? This term stems back from the days of the Grecian Empire, and it is the philosophy that every action of mankind should be for the purpose of personal pleasure, which is simply pleasing self. In other words, it is the mindset that everything that we do should be driven whether or not, uh, by whether or not it is going to please ourselves. Believe it or not, this mindset to please self is very prevalent today. However, I want to say that it is a disease to self, it is a destruction to society, and it is devastating to a person's relationship with God. But how do we recognize this type of self-pleasing life? Then, is there a remedy to cure this hedonistic type of a lifestyle? Well, with those questions in mind, I believe that from this text that we have read in the Word of God, James identifies a couple of elements which help us to diagnose and treat this spiritual disease of constantly seeking to please self. The first element from this text that I want to point out to you is the symptoms of living a self-pleasing life. The symptoms of living a self-pleasing life. What are those symptoms? Well, one of them is conflict with others. Conflict with others. Notice with me what James says in verse number one. From whence comes wars, that is, unending quarrels, and fightings, that is, conflicts among you. James then answers with another question. Come they not hence even of your lust, that is, self-loving pleasures, that war about within your members, that is, within your bodies? Friend, I want to say all wars, all conflicts, and all fights started 
from an inner desire to get the upper hand on someone else so that that hedonistic nature within self is gratified. My friend, I must say that all conflicts internationally, locally, and domestically can be resolved when the inner nature of man to please self and to have self's way is set aside. It must be set aside. Well, the life of pleasing self, there's a symptom uh, of conflict with others. Then there's the symptom of murder. Oh, yes, murder. Notice verse number two, what James says. He says, ye lust and have not, ye kill. In other words, James is saying, you want what you uh, do not have that others have, so you go to the extent of killing them, murdering them. For in this type uh, of of a symptom a murder is true of society and you see people today live so much to please self that they will do anything to harm someone else if they think that they can get what that other person has uh, misty and i uh, enjoy in the evening watching an old carol o'connor show uh, called in the heat of the night uh, the other night we was watching and there was a man who had a business partner and this business partner was having an affair with this man's wife. So in order to gain this man's wife and to gain the business, this man came up with a plot to murder this man by putting a bomb in his car when the car was cranked. Friend, there, there are other things that people do uh, to murder others. And, and murdering people uh, goes beyond just physically killing people. You can kill and murder people in other ways as well. Oh, murder is definitely a terrible symptom of a self-pleasing life. Furthermore, there's the symptom of covetousness, covetousness. Notice the second half of verse number two. James says, and desire to have that, uh, literally the meaning is covet and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. That is, you do not ask God to covet is to earnestly desire that which you do not have. It is, now let me say, it is not wrong to desire things in life, but when you are dominated by wanting the things that others have and thinking about those things and how that it would satisfy you if you could have them, friend, then it is wrong. That is covetousness. You've heard the old saying before about keeping up with the Joneses. Well, James goes on to tell that instead of coveting what the Joneses have, that seek the Lord in prayer and ask him for what you should have. You see, when you ask God for what you should have, for what you think you need, then you can trust him to provide for you what is best for your life, whether or not it is what the Joneses have or not. There is the symptom of covetousness. Likewise, we see in verse number three, there is the symptom of unanswered prayer. Those who live a self-pleasing life experience the symptom of unanswered prayer. Notice verse three. Now, the Bible says, "You ye ask, that is, you ask God for things and receive not because ye ask amiss. Uh, the idea there is ye ask with the wrong motives. Uh, those wrong motives could be out of, a, out of selfishness or out of an ungodly agenda that ye may consume it upon your lust. James is saying that when you and I are living 
to please self and praying merely uh, that that God would uh, provide that that would please you, uh, then remember God's not going to answer that prayer for he knows the motives and and the reasons that are in your heart. He knows that you are simply asking for the purpose of pleasing your inner desires. You know, I've heard people say, prayer doesn't work, uh, for I've asked God for such and such, but he still hasn't given me what I wanted. Well, we should examine our prayers and make sure that we are praying with the right motives for if not, this could very well be the reason that we are not seeing God provide what we are asking for. Unanswered prayer is a symptom of a self-pleasing life. Uh, then, broken fellowship with God is a, is a symptom of the self-pleasing life. Broken fellowship with God. Notice verse 4 with me. James says, Ye adulterers, and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. In this verse, James is speaking not of a physical adultery, but of spiritual adultery. For in other words, he is talking about a believer who has a relationship with God, a believer who abandons a life of seeking to please and honor God and resorts to seeking to please their self. Uh, James calls this person a spiritual adulteress. The whole idea is based upon the Old Testament where Israel was the bride of God the Father. In Jeremiah, 3 and verse 20, the prophet tells the people, surely as a wife treacherously, uh, that word means unfaithfully, departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. In Exodus 34, verses 15 through 16, the Bible uh, is speaking to the nation of Israel and how that if they make covenants with the gods of the strange land or sacrifice to them, then that would be considered as spiritual adultery and spiritual prostitution. Why, the prophet Hosea spoke of this very sin of the nation of Israel and stated that they had played the role of the harlot when forsaking their God. Listen, to commit spiritual adultery today means that a person abandons living a life to please and honor and obey God for something else or someone else. And maybe that someone else is even self. Let me tell you, when you and I are saved, that is when we accept Christ into our heart as our personal Lord and Savior, we enter into a relationship like that of a husband and a wife. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. When we seek to live for self, that is to simply allow all of our choices and all of our actions to be for, for ourselves, we break the heart of our Savior. We literally commit spiritual adultery and we break that fellowship with Jesus Christ. Friend, this viewpoint of hedonism, living for the pleasure of self, it's destructive. This mindset causes conflict between people. This mindset causes conflict within the heart of the individual believer. This mindset causes a conflict in the relationship of the believer with Christ. The fellowship is broken. Living a life to please self is hurtful to others. It's hurtful to our own selves. But think about how it's hurtful to the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ who loves you unconditionally. 
these symptoms prove that this hedonistic, this self-pleasing lifestyle is a disease. But with that in mind, on the other hand, I want to say there is a cure. You say, is there really a cure? Is there really a remedy? Friend, the same word of God that points out our sin also shares with us a cure. So now I want to share with you this element. We see the symptoms of living a self-pleasing life. Now I want to share with you the steps for overcoming a self-pleasing life. The steps for overcoming a self-pleasing life. What are those steps? Well, consider this. Look to God for grace. Look to God for grace. Notice verse number six. James says, but he giveth more grace. Friend, yes, you may see yourself guilty of living a life to please self. However, I've got good news, and that is God is gracious. God is gracious. He is always gracious, and he will continue to be gr gracious. Overcoming this type of pleasure of seeking uh, to please self, it happens through a process of learning and growing. Along the way, there will be failures, yet he giveth more grace and more grace. I like the old song by Annie Flint that says, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplies peace. Look to God for grace. Then, if you want to overcome this lifestyle and this mindset of pleasing self, not only look to God for grace, but lay aside pride for humility. Lay aside pride for humility. Notice with me the latter part of verse 6. God resisteth, resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Literally, the idea is that God opposes the proud and haughty, but he giveth grace to those who lay aside their pride and their self-righteousness. It is only when we humble ourselves that we are in a position to receive help from God. So lay aside pride for humility. That is, get to a place, get in a place where you know that you have a problem and admit to God that He is your only hope for change. Well, lay aside pride for humility. Then, submit to God, submit to God if you want to overcome this self-pleasing life. Notice verse 7. James says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Now this is a command, an imperative. James is essentially saying to you and to me, surrender, resign, relinquish yourself and the control of yourself over to God. Now I realize this goes against the grain of society, yet God can give you and he can give me the ability and the grace to submit to him. Oh, if you'll just realize that you have been living to please self, then say, Lord, I give up. I am the one at a loss. I am wrong. I surrender my all to you. Friend, this is a necessary step for overcoming this lifestyle of living for self-pleasure. Uh, furthermore, if you want to overcome this lifestyle, this mindset of pleasing self, resist the devil. Notice the latter part of verse 7. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now I must point out that the before you can resist the devil, you must submit to God. The only way to resist the devil is to first submit to God. This action of giving in to his temptations must be replaced by submitting yourself to God. In Ephesians 4 and 27, Paul said, Neither give place to the devil. I want to tell you, as long as you listen to the devil, 
he will keep speaking to you. But when you resist him, that is when you cut him off, when you ignore him, he turns the other way. I, I'm, I remember hearing a story about a little boy and uh, this little boy, every time he got into trouble, he'd say, the devil told me to do it. The devil came knocking at my heart and, and he told me to do that. However, one day that little boy accepted Christ and his whole life changed and he started living differently and he started doing that which was right. And somebody asked him one day, said, uh, Johnny, why is it that, uh, that, that you, your life has changed? And, and uh, little Johnny said, well, you know, when the devil comes to knocking at my heart now, I don't go to the door. I ask Jesus to answer the door of my heart for me. You see, that little boy knew what it was. Instead of listening to Satan, instead of listening to those temptations, instead of lingering around uh, in those areas where he was prone to sin, he had turned his heart and his mind over to Jesus Christ. And therefore, he was letting Jesus rule and lead and guide his life. Well, resist the devil. Also, James tells us if we want to overcome temptations, excuse me, the temptation of pleasing self, if we want to overcome that lifestyle of self-pleasure, draw nigh to God. Look in verse number eight. He says, draw nigh, that is draw near to God, and he will draw nigh, that is draw near to you. Now, in terms of salvation, you and I who are believers, we are as close to God as we can be. But James is not speaking about salvation. He is speaking about our daily walk with Christ. That is our relationship with the Lord. He's calling us. He's telling us to draw near, draw nigh unto God. But how are we to draw near to God in our personal relationship with Him? Well, he tells us in verses 8 and 9, notice with me, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn uh, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. You see, we draw nigh to God when we stop doing evil. That is, cleanse our hands, stop doing evil. We draw nigh to God when we stop thinking evil. That is, purify your hearts. Let your mind, your thinking be cleansed and renewed through the word of God. We draw nigh to God when we feel remorse for our wickedness. That is, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Regret uh, what, what uh, the lifestyle of pleasing self and realize that that is not the best way of living. Oh no, God has a better way of life and that is living to please him. And then we draw nigh to God when we stop joking about our wickedness. James, that, that's the idea there. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Friend, this is the path for drawing nigh to God when we have been living a life uh, for the pleasure of self. Instead of running in a direction away from God, James tells us that we can overcome this uh, lifestyle of pleasing self by turning to God, turning to God. And then if you want to overcome this lifestyle of pleasing self, James tells us, let God lift you up to a higher plane of living. Notice verse number 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Friend, in God's kingdom, Jesus taught that the way, the way up is first by going down. In order to rejoice, you must first mourn. In order to uh, be exalted, you must be abased. If you want to overcome the disease of living for self, then humble yourself before the Lord and allow him to lift you to a higher and better plane of living for his honor and his glory.
in this message, we ha have identified the symptoms of, self, of a self-pleasing lifestyle. It is destructive to the individual. It is detrimental to the relationships of that individual. It is damaging to that individual's relationship with Christ. If you've listened to this message and the Holy Spirit of God has convicted you of the fact that you're living a life of pleasing self, then my friend, there is hope and forgiveness in the Lord. There are biblical steps that you can take in order to overcoming such a lifestyle. Look to God for grace. Lay aside pride for humility. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God. And then let God lift you up to a higher plane of living. For then you can overcome that lifestyle of living for self and start living for God. God bless you.